So good to be with you. Okay, I got to share a story with you. So, um, you know, a few years ago when I was living at my parents' house, my uh, job that I had taken on, my role was I was the official person in the house who would pick my parents up from the airport when they needed somebody to pick them up for. And maybe you have that role, maybe not, but I'll tell you what, uh, I far prefer picking people up at Midway Airport any day over O'Hare. Anybody get an amen there? Let's get, a, let's get rid of O'Hare. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Midway is, amen. Midway is just closer, it's better, it's smaller. I like all of those things. So, you know, my dad and my mom were going on all these trips, and this particular time, my dad had gone on a trip. And he gave me the ring. He said, hey, Josiah, I need you to pick me up, 2 p.m. Don't forget to pick me up. You know, I'm going to be there, and uh, I'll text you when I land. So I'm like, okay, Dad, got it. I show up early. I get in one of the cell phone lots, and I'm waiting, waiting for that text, scrolling on my phone, and I finally get the text. My dad says, hey, I just landed. So I head over to the airport. By the way, secret trick, go to the cell phone lot so you don't have to have the security guards look at you like stare you down and like basically tell you to go every 30 times that you go around like don't look at me again, don't look at me again. So I show up there and it's my time to finally pick him up. He's basically updating me on how he's moving throughout the airport. Hey, you know, just got through, walking through, picking up my bags, about to come out. So I, I get in the line after going around all these times, I get there in front and there's, at this time, at Mid I've been at Midway when it's packed, but this time when we went to Midway, it was like very light, not a lot of people there. So I pull up, and my dad says, hey, I'm outside, look for, you know, 3B. So I'm looking, I'm going up, I go, I pull up right in front of where it says 3B. I'm here, and I said, okay, I text him, I'm saying, I'm here. He says, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm here, do you see me? I said, no, are you coming out? He says, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm walking out right now. You should be already be able to see me. And I'm looking. I mean, there's 10 people. It's like, where's Waldo? I'm looking for the bald guy. I'm like, not bald, not bald, not bald, not bald. And I don't see him. And I'm looking and I'm looking. He's not there. And he's like, he's like, I'm right here. I'm right by 3B. And I'm like, dad, you're not. So we get on the phone. When you got to shift from text to calls, now has gotten serious. <laughs> and I got on the phone with him, I'm like, Dad, I'm like, I'm in my car, like, looking like, Dad, I don't know where you are, but there is no other bald people out here. There's only 10 people, where are you at? And he's getting frustrated. He's like, Josiah, I said 3B. I'm like, I'm by 3B. He's like, I said 3B. I said, Dad, I'm 3B, I'm right here, 3B at Midway. There was a long pause <laughs> on the other end of the phone. And then he said, Midway, you're supposed to be at O'Hare. And then he said, I'm going to get a taxi. Beep. Isn't that a horrible feeling? When everything finally lines up and you're like, what, all this frustration, and then you finally realize that you were in the wrong place, that you're supposed to be somewhere to receive somebody or pick something up or get something, you're waiting, you're there, and you ended up going to the wrong location, the wrong place, the wrong airport, the wrong restaurant. It's a horrible thing to be in the wrong place, especially when you're waiting for something. And this is a spiritual element as well in our life. It's a horrible thing to be in the wrong place when you're trying to receive something from God, when you're trying to be set free by the truth, and you're trying to, you're, you really want to see transformation and breakthrough, but you cannot experience it if you're in the wrong place. The craziest thing is sometimes we fall into situations like myself where you don't even know that you're in the wrong place. That's the most scary, right? That's the most dangerous because you can solve a problem that you know that you have, but if you don't know that you have a problem, then how can you solve that problem? And so Jesus talks to us about this very idea in Scripture. 
He's like, hey, listen, sometimes people are in the wrong place, and he talks to us about the most important thing that we can be in the wrong place about. He talks to us about our heart being in the wrong place. The heart is the essence of who we are. It's the essence of your being. It's who you are. It's your most vulnerable, deepest, honest part. It's your heart. This is you. And God says, yeah, sometimes you can be in the wrong place, but even more dangerous is when your heart is in the wrong place. And when your heart is in the wrong place, you can't receive truth in the way that you need to receive truth. And truth is so valuable because truth sets us free. Truth sets us free. And so what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to take us through, Jesus is going to give us a story. We're in a series called Parables, and he's going to give us a parable, a story, right, that has, it's an earthly story of a heavenly principle, right? There's a big point of this story. And Jesus is really going to uncover this for us, and what I want us to do this morning is I want us to just pause, and, and to be honest with you, I want us to take a step back in humility and say, okay, I'm not going to jump to assume that I'm in one of these four. I'm going to take a posture of humility and say, maybe my heart is not, just maybe, just maybe my heart is not in the right place that God wants it to be. And I believe as we go through this story, I want you to kind of just ask, you know, as we're doing this, just kind of like ask, like, is that the place that my heart is at? And hopefully we can walk out of here with a greater clarity that our heart is either in the right place or it's in the wrong place, and then we can make some changes, amen? Amen. Join me in the gospel. The gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verse 4. This this parable or story is recorded in three of the four gospels. I chose this one because it's the shortest. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) Verse 4. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. And you can't see in the story, but I just want you to see Jesus is actually, we know this from the other accounts, he's in a boat because there's so many hundreds of people around him, and he's speaking to people who are on the beach. Here's the story. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. He's gonna give us four different soils. So the first one is, some seed was scattered and it fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Number two. Some fell on rocky soil, and when it came up, the plant withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Here's the fourth one. Still other seed fell on good soil. Everyone say good soil. soil. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. When he said this, so he finishes the story, and he's going to speak to his crowd really quick, and he says this, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Jesus was aware that not everybody that was listening to his story was going to be able to understand his story because their heart was not in the right place, and that's the reason why he says this. There's more explanation in Matthew chapter 13, which is the other story, but I won't go into that. But before we go into this, it's just understanding that Jesus is acknowledging to the people who are hearing his story. Let me say this. Jesus is the greatest teacher of all time. There is no better teacher has walked the face of the earth than Jesus. And he's being really clear that some people, he's like, hey, listen, some of you guys are going to get this, and some of you aren't. And he takes his disciples aside, and he gives them then the actual explanation of the story. And I'm really thankful that we don't have to try to come up with, try to think in our minds what Jesus is trying to say with these four different soils. He's gonna clearly explain to us this morning what he means by each soil and what each soil represents. Each soil represents a different heart condition or heart place. And if you're taking notes, write the first one down. Ask yourself, does this mean The first heart place is the unresponsive place. The unresponsive place. Listen as we dive in now, verse 11, Jesus explains the first soil and how that can be the heart of a person and what that looks like. Verse 11, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed, here's the explanation, the seed that's being thrown is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear 
and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. So the first soil that Jesus is going to explain to us is a soil of an unresponsive heart, or the way that he paints it in the story is a path that a farmer walks on. Now, we probably don't have a big uh, portion of this congregation that's farming. That's my guess. If you're wearing overalls in here, maybe, let me see, no, okay, no one's wearing, no farmers, or maybe you have a little garden in the back. But it's important for us to understand kind of the scene of this. And so this farmer who would have a bag thrown over his, over his shoulder with seeds coming out would throw the seeds like this. And obviously as the farmer doesn't want to walk on the crops or the seed that is being thrown, he would try to walk along the same path that's, that, that's in the middle of, the, uh, of the, the vineyard or the farmland. And so as he's walking on this path, he would try to stay on a certain path so that he didn't get on top of the crops. This path is what Jesus is expressing is what looks like some of our hearts. This path is hard. It's walked on. It's beaten down. You can tell that somebody walks this path often. This is not a place that if you're a farmer, you want to throw seeds because nothing's going to grow on it because it's too hard. Jesus tells us, he says, listen, some people's hearts are like this. Some people's, just like the, like the path is hard, some people's hearts are hard. And when the word of God, which is the seed of the farmer, gets thrown on the soil or gets shared with us in our life, if our heart is hard, we are not able to receive that truth. We, are, we may be even able to, un, to hear the truth, but we can't understand it. How many of us know there's something different between hearing and understanding, right? When your child across the table from you, you're telling them a long story or somebody across the table is... is and you're telling them, yeah, and then, you know, and then they came at me and they're like, yeah, you need to move off this. You can't park in that spot. And you're like, do you think that's right? And they tell you and they go, mm-hmm, yeah. Are you listening to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some husbands are really good at this, right? They can repeat the last three words. Yeah, you said the last, you said the last spot, right? Say, like, what did I say before that? Mm. You know, you can hear, yeah, you may even be able to repeat back the words, right? Because you can get good at listening without listening. But there's a difference between listening or hearing and understanding what somebody is saying. Jesus is saying, listen, there's a lot of people that can hear my words, hear my truth, hear my gospel. But it's one thing to hear it, and it's another thing to understand the meaning of it and what is meant by those words. There's a difference between just hearing and understanding. And he's saying there's some people that they hear, those seeds are thrown in their life, they hear the truth, but they don't understand it because their heart, just like the soil of a farmer's path, is not ready to receive the truth, and so it cannot grow and become something beautiful or produce goodness or joy or peace or faithfulness in their life. Not only do we trample on it, but Jesus actually shows us a key problem with this, and he points to our enemy. After farmers would be throwing their seed, they would have birds that would follow them. You know, the birds are smart, right? They know where the food's at. You ever seen the pigeons right by the CTA? <laughs> Pretty smart. Ugly, but smart. No, I'm just kidding. And as the farmers throw in these seeds along the path, these birds would follow and wait till the farmers just a little bit away. The seed would not be deep in the ground, and because it's hard, the bird would come and snatch up the seed and then eat it. The Bible says that's what the enemy is like in our lives. When someone sows, when you have the truth sown into your life, when you hear the truth of God or the truth from God and it gets planted into your life, whether it's a radio or this or someone shares it with you, you read the Bible, that the enemy is trying to stop that seed before it ever produces fruit. It's much easier to snatch a seed than to cut down a tree. 
The enemy is afraid of what happens when truth really plants its, really starts to grow and put its roots down and start to spring forward in the life that comes from it. The enemy does not want truth to take over your life. He doesn't want it to flourish. He doesn't want it to transform your relationships as truth does. He doesn't want to see you free. You know what the Bible says? That you have an enemy and that the enemy is Satan. And the picture, the other language we get in this passage, we get the picture of Satan being like a bird, but in other places in Scripture, we get the picture of Satan being like a lion. Scripture says, Satan is like a lion. Out, he, he's out to devour you, kill, steal, and destroy your life. He doesn't want you to have a marriage or relationship, a relationship with your kids that is healthy and flourishing. He wants you to, guys to be at odds with each other and broken down in division. He doesn't want you to have a, a language that speaks and uplifts people like the truth of the word of God says. No, he doesn't want that seed to grow in your life. He wants to snatch that so you tear down people with your words. He doesn't want you to trust in him when he tells you he'll always provide with you. And so when that seed gets thrown into your heart, into your life, the enemy wants to try to snatch that seed from you as quickly as possible because he's scared of what would happen if that truth became something more in your life and grew. See, you have an enemy out to kill, steal, and destroy you. And as much as we're aware of the physical world that we're in, and the wars that happen, like Ukraine that's happening right now, and our prayers are with Ukraine, and the atrocities that are being done to those people, there is a spiritual world that we are unaware of as well, that we are blind to in this moment, but that God speaks about in the Bible. And the Bible says that we are at spiritual war with the enemy. You have a lion who is the enemy, who is watching you and stalking you like prey. And his job is to wait for your weak moment to try to catch you up, rip you of all truth so that your life can wither away. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus came to make a way. Jesus came to, to make a breakthrough. Jesus came to bring dead people to life. Jesus came to overthrow Satan in the right time. And so we don't have to be afraid of Satan. Hear me clearly. We don't have to be afraid of Satan, but we do need to be aware of him. The Bible says be aware of the enemy's schemes so that you cannot be outsmarted. You ever have somebody come up to you? I was in Israel. I took three months. I studied in the land of Jerusalem. I was studying the Bible, and I had somebody come up to me in this really nice, like, luxury kind of, like, shopping center, and they came up to me, and they said, hey, you want to buy a Rolex? And I'm like, dude, I'm a college student. I'm broke. Do I look like the target audience for Rolex? No, no, no. These are, like, real good prices. You know, it's Israel. I'm like, real good prices. Israel. And then he goes, yeah, check all these out. No joke. Right on the street. Yeah, check all these out. These are the newest versions right here. Like feet away from like the Rolex store. I'm like, are you a salesman? Are they, you guys going out now? It's amazing. Good for Rolex. Listen, that guy wouldn't be selling if there weren't people falling for it. If that wasn't a marketable business, he wouldn't be doing it. But he catches people because there's people that go, yeah, probably prices are different in Israel. Yeah, here's $1,000, boom, here's $200, boom, yeah, really great. And so people get caught in these things because they're unaware of the schemes that are around them. Christians, friends, be aware of the schemes of the enemy. He is out to kill, steal, and destroy you. And if you're unaware of his presence and how he is out to get you, you say, I'm at odds all with people. Yeah, but you have an enemy that because you became a Christian, you are a threat to him. And he is trying, and he is not only is trying, but he is succeeding in a lot of our lives, and he is snatching the seeds of truth in our life because we've allowed our heart to be hard. And let me say this before I move on to the second one. Let me be really clear with you because it's important. Our heart gets hard when we choose to, to live in a way that God hasn't called us to live in, and we know it, but we continue to walk away from that way. Like, you know, hey, like, this is not... This is the right way that God's called you to live. 
And maybe there's a step of obedience that God has imprinted in place on your heart and you're like, I know I need to do this, God. I know I need to start treating people. I know I need to start doing this right. But we walk, up, nah, well, not today. Can I say this to you? Sometimes we have a step of obedience that God has placed upon our life and we delay it. I'll come, I'll do it later. But when I'm more ready, I'll come back to that. And every day that we say no to the word of God and the voice that he said, you need to do this, our heart becomes more hard till we've drifted all the way over here and we wonder why I can't get anything out of a sermon. I can't get anything when I read my Bible and God's going, you know why? Because your heart is hard so you cannot receive the truth like you used to. See, that soil of your heart needs to be broken up so that the seed of my truth can take root in your life and you can be transformed by the power of my word which created the galaxies and the universe and can change and transform your life. But my word cannot transform your life in the way that it needs to if my seed cannot take root because your heart is hard because you're living in unrepentant sin. Number two, not only the unresponsive place, but write this down, this is important, the superficial place. The second place that our heart can be in is a superficial place, a superficial setting, a superficial condition. Jesus paints the second soil and gives us the explanation. Verse 13, those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. Everyone say root. root. They believe for a while, so it's a short-lived faith, but in the time of testing, they fall away. And the imagery here with this, with this soil, because my mind thinks of like a bunch of little rocks thrown, and that's really not the picture of what's being talked about here in Jesus' time. The better picture, so you can see it in your mind, is that there would be some, you know, uh, soil on top, but under, shortly under that soil would be a larger rock that was under, or a rock bed, mostly limestone. And so, you know, if this is the plant and here's the limestone, yeah, yeah, you know, the plant could go down a little bit, but eventually the plant's roots start hitting the foundation. In other words, the roots of this plant, the roots of this seed cannot grow into what it needs to be like because there should be it should be able to go deeper and deeper and grow to be more and more the deeper the roots the higher and stronger the plant but it can't do that because there's a rock bed that is stunting the growth of this seed Jesus says this is someone I want to, I want to see I want you to see the person in the heart this is someone that hears the truth they hear the gospel, they hear the word of God, and they're like, wow, that is amazing. You know about this joy, high five to joy, Pastor Josiah, it's, whoa. And let me tell you about this love, wow, high five to love, Pastor Josiah, yeah, I love that love stuff. It's like, woo, it's good. High five to faith. It's like, yeah, faith and commitment, all this stuff. Yeah, I love that. And then it's like, hey, repentance. Ooh. Repent what? Blessing. High five to blessing. Yes. I, I know some Christians like, yes, I love blessing and joy and goodness. Amen, pastor. Hey, forgiveness. Ooh. Yeah. I like the give part of forgiveness, but the forgive. In other words, sometimes our faith is more of a pick and choose type of faith. And we wanna agree with the things that are real. I mean, there's some amazing, I mean, even people that aren't Christians, they look at some of the stuff in Christianity and it's hard not to agree with, right? How you treat your neighbor, how you love one another, the Samaritan story, like there's amazing truth that is transformative. But you know what? There's some hard truth in the Bible as well. I love the blessings and the goodness and the joy and the hope, but there's some stuff in the Bible that kind of, me as a person, I really have to wrestle with sometimes. I have to submit to, like when the Bible says we gotta die to ourselves. it's like, ooh. Die to ourselves, you're not gonna like deny myself, die to myself. Yeah, Jesus says that's what it requires to be a follower of him. Repentance, 
That means when you know that something's wrong, God's revealed it to you, you're aware of it, and you say, God, because I'm a follower of you, I'm gonna turn from this, and I'm gonna turn to follow you and live my way right. That's challenging, right? Because we have feelings, we have emotions, we have ties to things that are not right, and yet God is saying, listen, that's what I've called you to. Repentance, forgiveness, sacrifice, service. These are part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. The word says God did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus could have came as a king to rule and had people serve him at all, but he didn't come in that stature. He came to serve. And Jesus is saying, listen, the person that maybe they hear all these good things about truth and they agree with it and they high five, but when troubles come, when trials come, Hey, just so that we can kind of encourage one another this morning, if you're a Christian in the room, can you raise your hand and just let me know if you've ever been through a trial? Anyone ever have troubles in the room? Any storms out there where you're like, I don't know how I'm gonna get through this, storms, yeah? Wait a minute, I thought Christians were not supposed to go through any storms. No, 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 no. See, Christianity is not not about not going through storms, it's about who you go through the storm with that we go through the storm with God. It's not about removing the storm, it's about God being in the middle of the storm with us and empowering us and giving us what we need spiritually and physically to get through the storm. That's the difference of Christianity. God never promises that we will not have troubles and trials. Actually, he promises the opposite. He says that following me will cost you Nobody starts to build a house or a building until they've counted the cost. If not, you look like a fool because you start building the house and then you run out of money and resources to build it and then the house is left there and it's unfinished. God says, listen, count the cost before you choose to follow me because there's a cost. And this is the type of soil, it's one that is rocky, it's superficial in the sense that, you know, there's strong emotions on the front end, but it's a rejection of the harder teachings of Christianity, the full package. It's a half package Christianity, not a full version. Man, even as a pastor, there's some things I go through in the Bible, I'm like, ooh, that is tough. I don't don't really like that, Jesus. Jesus. I've had moments in my life where God has called me to make peace with people that have deeply hurt me. And, and, and I'm like, oh, God, why don't they come to me? You ever say that? One of the most convicting verses I ever read in the Bible is Jesus says, before you bring your offering, he doesn't say, hey, make sure that you're all good with your brother. He says, this is what he says, if your brother has something against you. I was so humbled by that. I really didn't like that either. I'm being honest. Because sometimes I'm, at, I'm like, I don't have anything wrong with them. If they got issues with me, that's fine. They can have their beef. I don't, cut, cut. I don't need them. I'll move on. I got good friends. <laughs> and then the Holy Spirit goes, whoosh. Actually, what I said in my word is, I don't really care if you don't have issues with them. If they have issues with you, you need to go to them and make sure that you can do everything that you can to bring peace. If they don't want peace, that's on them. But you better attempt it, Josiah. I'm like, oh, God, you got to be a Christian. Like, you got to put this on me, busy. I'm this and that. And God's like, you are called to do that, Josiah. Be at peace with people. And it's hard. And it's uncomfortable. And it's stretching. And it's humbling to me because sometimes the person has wronged me far more than I've wronged them. But that's the cost. That's the call. That God has called us to be peacemakers. And God's saying, I want that seed to grow in your life and become something amazing. I want to say this because I I don't know much about plants and roots, let me be honest. Every time I leave for a trip with my wife, the plants all die in our place. (laughs) Like they are on life support by the time we get back. Literally, they are up and standing by the time, and when we leave, they're slouching over like, dude, we can't keep going. 
So I am by no means any expert. So I was looking up, I was like, I want to understand, like, I know what a general understanding of roots are, but I started to read a little bit about the roots of something. Listen to the importance of it. Listen to what it says. This is from uh, uh, somebody that's really good at plants, not me. (laughs) Roots provide the anchor needed to keep a plant in place. Roots are the lifeline of a plant taking up air, water, and nutrients from the soil and moving them into the leaves. Think about this picture, what, how important the roots are to the health of this. And sometimes you can tell the health of a plant not by the leaves right away, but when you look at the roots. And so when you take a look at the roots, listen, the reason that plants don't just, all plants just don't get thrown up during a storm is because they have deep roots, and the deep roots allow them to weather the storm. Our deep roots as Christian are in the truth of the word of God and in Jesus. And when the storm goes through, there's some that get blown away. Those are the people with faith that is shallow roots. And so when the storm goes by, they can't handle the wind. They can't handle the pressure. Their roots do not help them stay firm and founded in Christ. And that's why Jesus is saying some people get so excited, but they fall away when the trouble, when the storm comes, they get brushed up, they get uprooted, they get thrown out. So you need to make sure that your roots in the faith are deep. A lot of people over the last two years had their roots uplifted or have been blown by the storm and their faith is a fraction of what it used to be. And there's some people that their faith is stronger than ever before because through the storm, they've had their roots go deeper than ever before and their trust has been strengthened more than ever before in their life. The third place that our heart can be is the crowded place. The crowded place. Verse 14 The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear. Once again, every single one of these soils or places, they hear. The the problem is not that they're deaf. The problem is not that these people are not intellectual. This has nothing to do with intellect, and it has nothing to do with intelligence. This has everything to do with the heart. There are some incredibly intelligent people that because their heart is hard, they reject the truth of God. Let me say that again. Some people, oh, I'm too intelligent for Christianity. I'm too smart for Christianity. I believe in you know, unicorns and Harry Potter too. I've had those conversations and I enjoy having those conversations because like, let's talk. I wanna share with you why I believe what I believe. But it's not a problem of like, Christians like, oh yeah, those dumb atheists. Why are you saying those dumb atheists? There's some really smart atheists and agnostics. Very intelligent people. It has nothing to do with intellect. It has to do with the heart. And I believe that hell is paved with a road of highly intellectual people that say, I'm too smart for Christianity, that God was chasing after and pursuing. Don't ever allow your intellect to make you feel like it, intellect to guise itself as pride and think that you're too smart. Listen, listen, God is reaching out to some people in this season and time like he's never reached out before in your life, calling you to him, calling you to truth, calling you to, to being uh, rooted in him and transformed by him, but it comes to the door of humility. When our heart is not prepared, we cannot hear or receive or understand from God in the way that we need to. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, the riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. Jesus says, hey, the third picture of the heart here is one that's too crowded. It's a heart that maybe you know some truth, maybe you've heard about God, maybe you're even trying to follow God, you're trying to pursue him, but there are these, so you have something beautiful trying to come up, some truth, some, something that's going to change your life trying to come out, but it's choked out by two things. The first one is worry. I think all of us have wrestled with a level of worry and anxiety in the last two years like never before. What's going to happen with the economy? What's going to happen with my job? Are we going to move into World War III? What's gonna happen with this pandemic? 
what's gonna happen, the political tension, the racial tension, what is gonna happen, and there's been so much happening. The, the future seems more unknown than ever, and it's really easy to get anxious and worried about the future. And not knowing what's gonna happen tomorrow or next year or if it's all gonna end and that, and there's this worry that can just grip us with fear and overwhelm our lives so that it affects every single aspect of our life because we're so afraid of what's going to happen. I find myself worrying. I mean, worry is, you know, sometimes it's less realistic than others, right? I get really worried about silly stuff sometimes. And my mind goes to the worst place, right? Always like the worst case scenario, like 0.001%. I'm like, that's what's going to happen to me. Like every time my gas tank is in that like last quarter quadrant right there and my phone's like halfway battery, I'm like, I'm stranded. <laughs> this is it. I'm done. I should call my funeral arrangements right now. But how crazy, is this not how fear works? You're driving, you're like, well, I only got like half of a, half of a quarter left, but well, whew, well, I hope I can make it home, but if I don't make it home and my, my phone dies, then I'll be out here and the wolves will eat me, and once the wolves eat me, then they won't be able to put my body anywhere, and then they won't remember me anymore, and I'll be forgotten forever. <laughs> and you're like, oh, well, that's not, but, but it is. Right? You don't even have the doctor's report yet, and you are so overwhelmed thinking that it's going to be one of those things, and you have no clue. Your life, you're telling people that you already have it, and the doctor hasn't even cleared it yet. You're like, yeah, I think I'm like, I'm stage two. You're like, dude, the doctor didn't even tell you anything yet. I know, I just feel it in my soul, though. I just feel like it's not going to be good, man. I'm just, I'm feeling like, I just feel like the Grim Reaper's over me. It's like, dude, it's, you just have to work out. Just your BMI's two things over the thing. You're good. You're good. But that's how worry is, and it can just stretch itself all over our life to every corner for our work, our relationships, our faith. And when it comes into our faith, let me tell you what it chokes out. It chokes out the truth that God's telling you to live your life on. And you lose your job, and it, yeah, you, you may not have a job right away, but you start going to the worst case scenario, and God's like, no, 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 you are allowing that lie, you are allowing that circumstance, that's a real circumstance in your life, to that worry, to choke out all the promises that I've made to you. I told you I'm going to be there for you. You're not just somebody. You're my child. I am the perfect father, and I have all the resources in the world to take care of you. And when you're most worried is when you most need to trust God. God has over 6,000 promises in the Bible for us to hold on to. And what worry does is worry chokes out the life of those promises so that you start to question the truth that you've lived your life on. How can you expect to have peace from God if your truth from God is being choked out by worry? Then he says, not only worry can it choke out the truth and the growth and the maturity that comes in our life from applying truth, but he says also riches and pleasure. And let me say this, because a lot of times people misquote scripture and try to twist it. You know, being wealthy or having riches is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Job, Solomon, Abraham, David, incredibly, incredibly wealthy men. Not the issue in the Bible. Also very godly men. Not the issue. The issue is when pleasure and wealth become the thing that you live for. It's the pursuit of riches. It's the love of money. It's the desire for pleasure above everything else in your life, that everything is secondary in your life to doing this hobby that you love and enjoy so much. And God is saying, yeah, I know that you love that, but you've made me secondary in your life, and it is choking out the promises that I've given to you. 
It is choking out the truth that I'm trying to allow to get planted in your life and your grow. And you're sitting in that sermon, and it's truth that can transform your life. You're reading your Bible. It's truth that can transform your life from me, the eternal being. But you're allowing your heart to be hard. You're allowing thorns in your life. The, the second that you read that verse in the morning, because you go to work and there's this greed that overtakes your life, it is choking out, choking out. The seeds of faith, the seeds of life, the truth that should be overwhelming and overflowing in your life. One pastor says, worry is practical atheism. It is unbelief, acting like an orphan without a heavenly father who's made 6,000 promises to you. And let me finish with the last and final one. Actually, let me say one more. little, just one more little nugget. So once again, reading about plants, there was one person that said, these, these tough, thistle-bearing weeds and thorns come up and they choke out the good plants by taking, listen to this, the thorns come up and choke out the good plants by taking most of the space, the moisture, the nourishment, and sunlight for themselves. In other words... These things become so prominent in your life that they take everything away that you should be giving to God. They overcrowd your heart. And you're like, no, no, God, I got, I got place for you amongst this and my third business and this and that and this. I got place, God, this little window right here on Sunday morning for 45 minutes. As Pastor, Mike, Pastor Mark preaches that an hour right here, this little window right here, you know, that's for you, God. But what do you mean there's room in my life? God said, there's room in your life? You give me an hour a week, and even the hour that you give me, you're thinking about all these other things the entire time that you're there. They are choking out your faith. And you wonder why there's an emptiness, and it's because you have no place for me in your life. I am trying to plant my seeds of truth that will set your relationship free, that will break you free of the bondage that you have in your finances because you're a slave to your debt and you need to imply my principles. That they will set you free. You're wondering where all this gloom in your life comes from, but it's coming from unforgiveness that you release, but you're not allowing the seed of grace and mercy to be planted in your soul and your life. And you say, there's room for me, but it is being choked out by these other thorns, these weeds in your life that are taking all the best of you from me. Now last. Fourth and, now, fourth and last. The fourth place that our heart can be at, the heart, place that we want our heart to be at, is the receptive place. Listen to verse 15. But the good seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, same thing that everybody else is doing, they hear the word and retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. This is the soil that is both fertile, it doesn't have rocks, it doesn't have weeds. It's a heart that is ready for God's truth. It's humble and open to hear the words from God, even when it contradicts the current practices of your life. It's a heart that's desperate and saying, God, I. I need your way because I've misled myself so many times. I'm finally ready to hear you, God. I'm finally ready for, to receive your truth in my heart and my life and for it to take hold and for it to transform my life, God. I'm ready. I have place. It's room. I don't just give you a section, but it's my whole heart. When God sees that heart condition, that's when things start to change. That's when things start to get crazy. That's when things really start to transform. And let me be really clear with you this morning. It doesn't just transform and change just a little bit. Matthew 13, which talks about the exact same story, gives us a little bit more context. And Jesus actually built in Matthew, he gives us specifically how much greater the crop is when it's on the good soil. The typical soil would produce about tenfold the, the harvest of that day, tenfold crop. Jesus says in Matthew that when we have this type of heart, the yield will be 30 
uh, 30 times, 60 times, 100 times. Jesus is saying, listen, when you give your heart to me and your heart's in a place that's ready to receive from me, you will not just have an average transformation. You will have an overwhelming overhaul of your life. You will never be the same. I will transform you with my truth and it will take place in your life and it will transform your marriages and it will transform your children. It will transform the way you work. It will transform your speech. You will not be left untouched when my truth takes hold of your life because you cannot be the same. Jesus says, when you let me in and you will really, you say, God, I'm at a place. I've tried my own, but I'm at a place and I'm ready to finally try your way, God. I'm open. I'm gonna put those things to the side. I'm gonna take the thorns. I'm gonna remove the rocks from my life, God. I'm gonna... Leave old sin behind so my heart gets soft. And God says, listen, I am not going to just give you an average transformation or average yield. You will have fruit that other people will eat from. In other words, you will become a source of life, not just for your family, but everyone around you will be able to partake in the life of your overflowingness. This is not a harvest just for your family. This is a harvest for your workplace and your extended family. This is a harvest for your neighbor. This is a harvest for somebody you bump into on the street. Your life will be so overwhelming with goodness and joy and gratefulness and holiness that you will never be the same and everybody else around you will be changed as well. And they will look to you and say, I want what that person has. I want the life that that person has. I want the perspective that that person has. I want the peace in the storm that that person has. I want the gratefulness that that person has. I want the favor and blessing like that person has. I want a taste of that. And God says, taste and see. Taste and see my goodness. Taste and see my goodness. You think you have it on your own. You think you've reached the pinnacle. Taste and see you will never go back to what you've had before God. Amen. Will you stand with me? When someone's heart is hard, when our hearts are unable to receive the truth and those roots for whatever reason or another, that life is not be able, to, able to be had in our life, we're not in the final place. How does God wake up a nation when they've strayed from him? How does God wake up a city when a city's grown cold to God? How does God wake up and break up the soil of a family's heart when they want nothing to do with him? How does God break up a person's heart when their heart is hard and they don't know what's going on, they just don't like the fruit of their life, but they know they need something but something to change, but they, they don't even like, they're not fully ready, they're this and that, they're just, they're still far, they're still living their way. How does God, almighty, the eternal one, the great I am, ancient of days, how does the one who created us wake us up? He wakes us up with a storm. How does the soil get broken up? The hard soil that's not gonna produce anything. How does it get ready? How does it get fertile? Oftentimes, it comes from a storm. And so many of us would never have come to God, would never have been willing to receive from God, would never have been willing to take that step that God placed upon our heart unless we were brought to our knees because of a storm. A storm that shakes the entirety of the world in so many different ways that the things that we used to hope in, we feel like I can't even hope in that anymore and we're not even looking for God, we're just looking for something and in that pursuit of something, we find God. God has done a shaking. And not that God is the source of the storm, even though he can be, 
but God can use a storm to bring us to him. And it's oftentimes the way he brings us to him. It's because when we're brought to our knees by a storm, we are finally able to come to God with the right heart. And God says, I have been calling you, seeking you, chasing you for so long. And you have ignored me. You have walked past me. You have been too busy for me. And I brought the storm or used the storm to bring you back to me. To bring you to your knees to finally say, God, I finally hear and understand you. And I'm going to invite, I'm going to 